The purpose of this video is to provide a succinct summary of some of the goodness of fit measures that you will encounter in chapter 12. The first measure I want to talk about is the standard error. The standard error is found at the top part of the part of the regression output. I'll show you that in a second. But it implies um, sort of how well the model fits our data. If our data is are very are located very close to the line, then this is going to be a smaller number. Uh, the more dispersion we see in our data, then of course the larger this number is going to be. This number is always reported in the same unit as the dependent variable and so it can be quite large and still be a good indicator and this also makes this measure difficult to compare across different regression models because depending on the unit that we're interested in and the dependent variable th these numbers could be quite different so let's just take a look quickly at an example and so you can see sort of visually see what I'm talking about so what you see in front of you is the relationship between uh, disposable income and consumption. We think that consumption is dependent upon one's disposable income. And so what I did here was just highlight what it is I'm talking about. So here we go, here's the standard error. Remember this is actually in dollars, so we could actually put it like this in dollars. and it is reflective of our dependent variable, which in this case is uh, consumption. If you're interested in knowing how to calculate it, you just take the residual from sum of squares, which is here, and divide it by n minus k minus 1. So in this case, we would take n, um, which I think is 22, and subtract uh, k which is the number of variables so one and then another one so we're going to be using the number 20 to divide into it and we're going to get the standard error of 742 which seems like a high number but really it suggests that we have a pretty good fit with our line and so let me just show you what I've graphed here so you can see here that you know indeed we have a pretty good fit model fit the line is almost right on top of the dots so this number, 742, is sort of the sum of the difference between the line and where our dot is across this whole um, regression line, kind of broadly, that's what it's talking about. Okay, so let's move on now to the next uh, goodness of fit estimate. The second goodness of fit measure that I want to talk about is the coefficient of determination, commonly referred to as R squared. Uh, here it shows you how to uh, compute it, but basically what you need to understand is that the R squared is basically the amount of variation that the response variable um, explains by changes in the explanatory variable. The R squared is what we use to determine how much our independent variables help us understand our dependent variables. As it states here, the R squared quantifies the fraction of variation that the responsible variable that is explained by changes in the explanatory variables. So basically it's the same thing. It's te it tells us how much our um, independent variables help us understand about our dependent variables. It's comprised of, or we compute it by taking the variation explained by the regression equation, which is, you know, the sum of squares due to regression, or SSR, and the unexplained variation, the sum of squares due to error. So let's go back to that same problem that we were just looking at, and then let's just look at where this number is and what exactly it tells us about the problem. So here we have the R squared highlighted in green, and we can see that we obtained this number by dividing the SSR, which is this number here, divided by the SST, and then that's going to give us uh, this 0.9899. And what that tells us is the amount of variation in our Y variable that our X variable explains. From there we're going to take a look at this adjusted R square, because adjusted R square enables us a way to account for 
when we have multiple variables explaining something. The adjusted R-square penalizes the model for having too many variables. So it's been said that if you put enough variables in any model, you can get a really, really high R-square. So you have to have something to account for how many variables you have in the model. So in our model, you're not going to see a big difference because we only have one variable in the model. But I have reviewed papers before that had, you know, 10 uh, independent variables and they explained, you know, 90% of the variance. But of course it does because they have so many things in the equation. There's a lot of noise in there. So the adjusted R squared is what you should use when you have more than one independent variable. That's really all there is to it. It's just another goodness of fit measure. It's a little bit like the R squared, but it is always provided in the Excel output and it, and it provides us a different piece of information, which is when we take into account multiple independent variables, how much of the dependent variable can we really explain? So let's just take a look, knowing of course it's not gonna be much different. So see here the R squared, I mean, I guess it's actually the same. And that's because we only have two variables in our equation. Uh, for some of the problems where we had multiple, you could see there was a difference here. So anytime you have multiple independent variables, please be aware of that using adjusted square R squared is a much better way to go. So by far the most common test we run with a regression model is to test whether or not the slopes are equal to zero. So almost always our null hypothesis is that the slope equals zero and then our null and our alternative is going to be that it does not equal zero. So this, the next test that we're going to talk about, the t-test and the related p-value, tells us whether or not our coefficient has statistical significance or not. So we get our regression output, we look at our coefficient, and then the next thing we've got to look at is to see whether or not our uh, coefficient is actually uh, statistically important to our data. So let's take a look here over at the uh, regression output and then you can see better what I'm talking about. I mean it essentially plays the role of beta 1 or beta 2 depending how many we have but I want to show you it as well. So what I've done is highlighted this disposable income in blue, or kind of highlighted it, I guess. And what it tells us is that we have a coefficient of 0.69, which we're happy with, right? We, we realize that, um, you know, any number is, is probably okay, but, but really what matters is this right here, our t-statistic and our p-value. If our t-statistic is greater than three, just like I've told you before, that means it's probably going to be statistically significant, but to be certain, we look over here at the p-value and we see it's basically zero. So this suggests that there's virtually no chance, I mean, I, I shouldn't say no, but there's very little chance, if you will, that our coefficient being zero has occurred on accident. So instead, it is 0.68, and we're pretty certain about this. I was telling a student in the course that this T stat is similar, loosely, very loosely, um, related to a Z, a Z score. The higher the better on this. And then this over here, the P value, we want to be very low. And the one we want to look at is the one for our, um, our model, our regression model, if you will, because we, 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 we often get a significant intercept, but we need to be careful not to look at that. We've got to look here at this line to make sure it's significant. So as you can see here, it's definitely significant. Now while I'm here, one other thing I want to talk to you about is this F-test. So exactly like on an ANOVA, actually, I mean, this is an ANOVA. It's just fulfill, fulfilling a different role, but it tells us this whether or not our model is fitting very well. I mean, that's a loose interpretation, but this very high F score here, see how it's like 1900? That means that our model fits these data very, very well. And so we're explaining a lot of variation. Now, of course, we have to have the significant P to go with our F, but as you can see from all those zeros, it's absolutely significant, uh, suggesting that uh, 
whatever we've done here is a very good fit of the model, and that's important. And the final thing I want to talk to you about is the upper and lower uh, limits for our confidence intervals here, right here. So what these tell us is that our beta here, our 0.686, is on average what we expect the uh, consumption to go up by. For every one unit increase in disposable income, we expect uh, consumption to go up by 0.8 or 686. However, there's a caveat, uh, and that is that we've got this thing called a standard error. So most of the time we expect it to go up by 0.686, but it varies like 68% of the time right around, you know, it's kind of plus or minus this 0 0.0155, or we can say that 95% of the time it will be between 0.6538 and 0.7183. And where did they get this from? Well. If you go look in the back of your book at the F table and you look up the degrees of freedom of 20 and 21, you'll find at 95%, you will find that the value is 2.05. So you can see here, multiply 2.05 times this standard error, 0 0.0155, and added it onto here, and I get the upper control limit. So that's where it's coming from. So what it's saying is that, you know, we know better than to think that we're going to be perfectly correct all the time, that it's always going to be exactly 0.686. And so what this tells us is that it should range between 0.6538 and 0.7183. Because we know that, you know, nothing is a perfect Thing, and we're doing a prediction nonetheless. And so this kind of gives us a, um, you know, a little, again, a little like a standard deviation around, it's called a standard error when it's on a line, but I mean, it's basically the same idea. It's the amount of variation we expect something to be around the line. I hope that this was helpful, and I hope you listen to this video before you do the quiz on chapter 12 and you will be happy to know that chapter 13 is really just more of chapter 12 and so you don't have to do a whole bunch more you're almost at the end all right so i hope this is helpful see you soon